La Bellezza d'Italia, the beauty of Italy. She will take your breath away. And the food, oh, well, it might make you cry. Italy is tradition, is passion, she is love. She is also Carla Squatrito, mother, accomplished chef, fearless entrepreneur. Like the amazing country of her birth, Carla's story is a story that must be shared. From her humble beginnings growing up in Torino, Italy, She's built an empire here in Connecticut that employs hundreds, feeds thousands across America and internationally, making some 47 million pounds of pasta a year. At the heart of everything she does is family and love. Carla is an inspiration to anyone who's had the passion to follow a dream. This is the story of Carlos Cuatrito's remarkable journey. Let's go back to your childhood when you were in um, Madonna del Meto. Yes. Del Meto. You, you know, small towns can make you feel safe. Yes. And they can make you yearn for something larger. What was that time like for you? It was, I was very conscious of the war because my father was in Turin and Turin was bombarded uh, every day and some more because it was in industrial center, so that's why they were taking good aims at Turin. And I remember being on my mother's arm and looking at the red sky, and she was telling me that my father was there, and she was hoping that he would come back and, uh, on the weekend, so she knew it was okay. And so you went to Madonna Dometto well, yes. to stay, to, to be safe? Yes. Did Everybody she... that could leave the city, it had a, a place to go, left the city because of the danger. Did your mother keep you safe in terms of what was going on, or did she tell you what you had to do to be safe there? Uh, both. Um, I never felt not safe. When I was little, I remember that my grandfather had this cistern that had no water in it, and that's where we were, he was hiding the young partisan. And they were telling me that I, if they ask for Zio Bruno, to not say where he was, because if they had known, they would have picked him up and killed him. And Uncle when Bruno he, was he part was, of the resistance? Yes. yes. In your house, you were safe and there was food. Is, yes. that, your, is that your first memory of food? How, what was it about the food that made you feel safe back then? It was always whatever was available, and there was always rabbits, eggs, vegetables from the garden, uh, especially in the spring. My grandmother used to pick up a tremendous amount of different herbs and make frittata. They were absolutely fantastic. And uh, I never had, uh, and I remember her with that uh, uh, rolling pin making pasta by hand. The flour was, uh, yes, the flour was rationed uh, and they had it, but, uh, this is your great grandmother's? My grandmother, yes, my mother's mother. From that house? From that and house. And Madonna? Yeah. So, was that the time you realized that, you know, was it just a curiosity watching her cook? I mean, what, what's the spark? When did it happen that you, you thought, I love being around this? I love oh my God, she that. was the kindest person, the real grandmother epitome that woman was. Very generous. Uh, she used to send me a bouquet of uh, uh, the wild um, uh, strawberries, you know, the little one that come like that. 
Uh, every spring, somebody was coming up with that uh, the, from her and flowers and stuff like that. So she was. Uh, you associate kind of, food with her? Yes. Kindness? Yes. You think, so does that make food an avenue for sharing? Yes. And communicating? Yes. It still is with the, my family and my granddaughters yeah. in particular. Dominic. It was 1967. I was practicing law in Manchester, Connecticut, but I had some a mutual friend down in Hamden, Connecticut, and I was told that this this young lady was coming and visiting with her ancient aunt to visit a nephew who was in the Hamden area, and I had a friend down there, and she said, why don't you come down and take this young lady around? She's going to be with all these old folks. And you know, she's gonna be kind of bored. So I said, ah, what the heck, why not? So I went down to visit her and I said, hey, this is a nice lady. I, in the next 12 days, I think I went down every other night to visit her. Then he, you go back to Italy. Yes. He thinks, how am I gonna be with her? I'm gonna go to Italy. And I said, hey, she's in Italy, I'm over here. Now what, now what am I gonna do? So in the following spring, which would have been in 1968, I decided to go to Italy and I told my partners, I'm going to Italy, I don't know when I'm coming back. Well, little did I know that when I went to Italy to see her, that was, the end of, that was, that was it for me. She was from Torino, the big city. Well, then she took me to the little town where her parents and all her relatives live, which is basically a farming community. I fell in love with the whole community. It wasn't in my, too much in my graces because he said that touring was not as interesting as Florence. Florence is a museum. Torino is a living place where things are happening, industry were blooming at that time, and this guy says it's not as interesting as Florence. Come on. How did you know you loved him? He had a different way of looking at the world. His, um, his letters were very engaging. Even if my English was not that great, his Italian was not that great, but the thought that came through were very interesting and they're very avant-garde and they're very progressive and I like that. Well, I'm so, not Italian. No, sometimes not. No? But, no, but uh, you Didn't were able to transmit. No, you were very able to transmit all of your interesting ideas that were fascinating to me. He proposes to you? Yes. I had a postcard, and the postcard had the Abbezzi di Vezzolano, which is a church that was built in 1100. And I wrote on the card where she would see it. I went to sleep and I left it where she would see it. So I showed her the card and I said, will you marry me here? So then I got up in the morning and I wrote, I see, see, yes. I was so enthralled with this man. It was interesting. It was a good-looking guy, and he was very sensitive in the way he expressed all his views. And and I said yes. So that's uh, then he came back in August, and we got married. Here I am, coming from Manchester, Connecticut, showing up there, uh, getting off an airplane. Next thing you know, uh, I'm going to get married at this church. My mother and father were there. And uh, the next thing you know, this absolutely beautiful woman steps out of the car and we walk into the church together. That was quite a day. In the honeymoon, we went all the way to Rome to get the, the documents uh, from the Italian, the American consulate to be able to travel back with them. I don't know if I would have been able to to live by myself without him at that point. So it was good. We came back and we went to the apartment that he had uh, prepared. And I go in and there is a box. Where? On the table at the no. apartment. Where? Where is the apartment? In what town? It meant the center of the world. You know, come on. Manchester. There was a box, a white box, this size. Uh, and, uh, and had mums on top, purple mums, 
purple mums are dead people flowers in Italy. So I said to myself, oh my God, that's the coffee with the... the, <laughs> with the, the <laughs> so then I opened it with all sorts of beautiful roses. So I said, okay, the inside is less scary. <laughs> so that's how it started. Had you had the talk about wanting children? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we thought that we wanted many more kids than we actually did. But I'm glad we didn't because these are, these are alive enough <laughs> and, and uh, demanding enough uh, to, to be sufficient. They were and they are incredibly interesting people. Uh, I don't know if they did it in purpose, but one ate the yolk and one ate the white of the egg, one ate the stem of the broccoli, one ate the broccoli. So I was all set. I think I'm fairly extroverted. I seek for knowledge from without. Um, and I don't mind rapid chaos. It's part of what I live in. I think as a sales guy, you kind of have to. My brother is an unbelievably intelligent, bright man. He is brilliant. And he lives in a much more geometric world. For him, life is building blocks. And when he is at most peace is when everything is solid. So one of the things that's different about Sandro and I is that Sandro is uh, the charismatic, outgoing, effervescent cheerleader, and I'm more the stoic uh, curmudgeon that's in the background trying to assemble the pieces to make the whole machine keep moving forward. How does it begin for you, this business, this idea of business, of saying to people here, that we can do more with food. I want you to taste my homeland. How did that begin? Ah, uh, with the availability of a ravioli machine, the vintage of that machine was the 30s, so kind of um, not an up-to-date kind of, and we still have it here in the entrance. We rented this uh, 1,800 square feet place between a music shop and a photo shop. And uh, in what town? Very Manchester. So, but but this is an actual business you're starting. Up to now, you're growing fruits and you're growing vegetables and My herbs husband, in your yeah. basement. My mom uh, and dad had a very different relationship with food than anybody in it. And one of the ways it expressed itself was in the basement, we had a corner of the basement. My father put some plywood down and filled it with sand, and we grew Belgian endive and radicchio very regularly. I remember that working well. I, my husband made the garden and grew, grew the vegetables for me, and I thought maybe this is a good way to do something that, uh, besides for my family and also for my, the people around that wouldn't, would like it. When I started in the store was 1980. Dominic says, you're too good in the store. You got to get out on the road and sell. Dominic, I never sold in my life. Just go out there. And I had a little Pinto, and I would drive around in this little Pinto, and I'd have some product in it. And I'd go in and I'd say, I had a sample kit. And I'd say, did you get anything free today? No. Well, here, I got a free package for you. Different pastas and everything. And then I'd go in and build a relationship with him. And if I went out and knocked on 12 restaurants, probably come back with 10 sales. I uh, came up here from New York City in 1984, and uh, I was lucky enough to meet a salesperson, Johnny, who was then the salesperson for Carla, and uh, he brought in a bag of uh, samples of pasta, and that's how the relationship began. Early, early on, uh, it, Carlo's pasta was called Pasta Italiana. One of the first jobs I was really proud of was that I could crack eggs faster than the 16 and 17 year olds. I had a big stainless steel bowl, two slats of um, two dozen eggs each, two garbage barrels, and I could crack them faster than them. I could also fold the pasta into the boxes better. My first job that I really remember at the store, uh, other than eating ice cream and being a real pain in the neck was, uh, I remember grating lemons. Uh, she would get a case of lemons, we were making uh, lemon ice, and we had to grate the lemons. And 
You have to grate until you get to the white, but not any of the white. They were involved right from the bottom, right up. They worked their way up. Where Sandro, then he, then what he did was uh, he'd come in and say, okay, what's my job? You're going to do this. I'd give him a lousy job. Because if you're going to do, you're going to start and learn everything. And that's what they did. And were you exposing people who hadn't re had real Italian food? Very many people were not of Italian descent and they just enjoy uh, something new and something different. It was, um, was an interesting start. I think in her own way, she also brought food to our region. You know, today, olive oil is like a known thing. Nutella is a known thing. Gelato is a known thing. Anchovies are a known thing. When she was doing this work, if you were an Italian, you knew what was in the store. Most of the people that came in were a curiosity. What's this pasta shop? They'd come in and they wouldn't recognize. I would say they'd recognize 5% what was in there. It was just a different time, and she brought a different thing to our little region. You know, they say, oh, Carla made this at home. No, Carla makes it right here at the store. There she is making stuff now. It's amazing to see from where we started and how things turned out today. It's just unbelievable. It was, uh, uh, was not all that easy. No. It was not because everything was done by hand. And at that time, I could mix, if I was quick, maybe 35 pounds of pasta an hour, 40 maybe or something. The hopper was so small that you could put only 15 pounds of stuff in it. So making ravioli was a real project. You had to be very fast at making pasta and then very fast at feeding it and running it. So it was a job. That would make you wonder why you wanted more. <laughs> uh, crazy. We had to do something because we couldn't satisfy the people that used to come because we couldn't sell meat ravioli or tortellini or whatever. I remember one time uh, sitting down the boys and telling them, you know, uh, this is not going to work. We have put all the money we could in this business. We are out of money and we have to close. And uh, the kids uh, when wanted me to bring home as much product as possible because they, they were disappointed that they were not going to have that. One of the worst days of my life, um, I'm coming down the hill and I see my mom's car in the driveway and I'm so excited that she's home. And before I even get into the kitchen, I can smell her making sauce, which is a big deal because that, at that time she didn't make a lot of pasta because she, she was working with it all day. She didn't want to make it was the, was the thing. But me, my brother, my father loved the meat ravioli with the marinara that she made. That was like our thing. And I walk in and she's making that. And she hasn't yet turned to me and I'm like, I catch this weird vibe. And um, she says, we're going to be eating pasta a lot for the next month or so. I said, why? She says, I have failed. And that was a tough day. And then things started changing. What happened? Change. We changed the, the course of where, who we were selling. What was the change that turned it around? We went, we went to sell to distributors. The big shift was from going from retail into distributors, and also there were I want to say it was the it was the mid '80s, so there was this explosion, and what all of a sudden it was much more desirable what she was making. It was like foodiness kind of was bubbling. My relationship with Carlos started in 1985. Um, we are what you call a food service broker. We um, are a sales agency, so we were hired by Carla to go out um, to the distribution network and to the end users and restaurants and colleges and schools and hospitals and, and demonstrate and show her product for her and, and uh, increase sales. And so it was either going into a restaurant and offering different pasta and different sauces uh, like some people do today, or it was gonna go into manufacturing. And having seen what the restaurant business is like, you stay away from that. So that's when we leased 6,000 square feet of space in uh, Manchester, in the industrial park there. And we had maybe three or four machines that barely fit in the store to put all over this place that was just so, so huge. And um, 
That's how we started. Carla, that is, in it's intimidating to no, think No, it's about. crying. I was a little crying, too. You were afraid. Oh, my God, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm asking you this because you are often described as someone who has a fierce commitment to her work. And I thought, you know, the word fierce doesn't impress me. Courage impresses me because with courage, you have to walk through fear to get where you're going. Do you feel like you had to walk through fearful times? Yeah, oh my God, yes. Because it's difficult to be a woman. In business, it's very difficult. So, how, uh, how so? Uh, because men will always talk to men before they talk to a woman. Would they talk to your son before they talk to you? Uh, or to the salesperson that was there with me or whatever, yeah. Yeah, oh, absolutely. The salesman was coming in to sell us a scale, and at the time it was a very expensive scale, a thousand bucks, and she and I are on the end of this line, Monte Cotti, and we're packing the Monte Cotti, the other people were running the stuff, and it was at a time when my mom couldn't take the time to go see him in the office. She was on the floor, he came in, and he's trying to sell this scale. And he keeps looking at me, and as he looks at me, I look at her like, hey guy, she's running the show here. And he'd look at me, and I go, no, no, look at her, and he didn't get it. And he left, and I said, Mom, how do you deal with that? She says, Sandra, I'm just, I'm used to it. And we go to meetings and people wouldn't even talk to her. They, they treat her like she was some figurehead and she didn't know what was going on. And people trying to swindle her because she was a woman or uh, just not taking her seriously when she really needed something done. And how did you handle that? It was part of the times. How could you rebel to that? That wasn't accepted. In, <laughs> it wasn't a very welcome thing. But did you get what you wanted? Well, apparently. <laughs> in spite. <laughs> Sandro started in sale because a, a, a salesperson consumed salesperson. One day came and said, I have to quit because my kids need me. I cannot travel anymore. I looked at Sandra and I said, you're bald. This kid was out of school, trying to work on production, doing work in production, and happy with where he was at. And all of a sudden, there he is with a suitcase in his, uh, in his hand, going all over the country, spreading the word. There is no pasta in town. We are making this and that and the other thing. And he did that for 10, 15 years, and his life was dedicated to the business. He used to come home, emptying his suitcase, getting a suitcase ready for Monday to go again. It was a, an ungodly life. And he has learned a lot. I don't think there is anybody in sales that can beat him. When I started out um, 20 years ago, we were at, uh, in Manchester on Progress Drive. And at that time we had probably 13 or 14 employees. Then now it's grown tremendously. I've been working alongside both of the boys, you know, Sanjo and Sergio, from uh, day one. And also I work a lot with Carla. She used to come in and train me how to make pasta, run the machines, what I need to do. And with her in the beginning, when I was in Manchester, it was uh, hands-on and everything. When we started um, the Carlos Pasta located in Manchester, and it's a very small place. We, um, example, in a production area, we count only about 20 employees, each chef. And uh, my first year, I um, started like hourly uh, employee on production floor. And um, I, after uh, the first year, I had the opportunity Ms. Carla gave me the opportunity to enjoy the QA department. 22 years now, I'm enjoying the QA department in uh, Carla's Pasta. So I get out of college and uh, I uh, graduated with a degree in uh, engineering and management from Clarkson University. And uh, at that time, they were adding on a whole bunch of equipment at the Progress Drive shop. And there was this push to do more. The distributor thing was going very well. Restaurants were, were really just going gangbusters. And things were, things were very, very good. 
So I came on board, we were adding equipment. I was working with the Italian mechanics coming on board, working in maintenance. And I seemed to evolve from working on maintenance to kind of trying to help out with production and try to get that kind of going. And we kind of hit a limit of what we could do at Progress Drive. So we built a new facility. We move into the new facility. And uh, it was a, a sea change for us. I think uh, a great amount of what Carlos Pasta's success is today falls on the core treasis of Italian food in Piemonte, and that is extremely few ingredients at the peak of their value, at the peak of the season, and don't beat them up. And what we've done over time is stay that vein. I think ultimately what our success is, is quality, and the quality stems from the raw materials. We buy Sardinian, Free Range, Pecorino, Romano. The starter for this cheese is somewhere in the neighborhood of five generations old, nobody knows. And it comes in 40 kilo loaves, and we house bull chop them. We don't grind them. The reason that we don't grind them is because grinding imparts heat. Heat brings you bacterial counts. So we are so fastidious about this thing and it's got to be 40 cents more than the next most expensive one and it's like two bucks more than the average that our competitors use and why do we use that because when you taste it it's different customers we talk to in the marketplace both at food shows and at retail are uh, very complimentary with regards to our quality that's the number one thing that they come back to us all the time for we don't scrimp on ingredients we're like i said 100 percent natural um, and we use the highest quality uh, raw materials that we can find. My experience in the food business has been 35 years. Uh, and I gotta tell you, she doesn't skimp anywhere, which is why the food is so enjoyed throughout the country. We use a significant amount of extra virgin olive oil. Now, most of our competitors will buy a pre-blended olive oil so that they don't have to worry about blending it. We buy extra virgin so we can control the acidity and we blend it in house because when you say extra virgin, it means that the fruit never touched the ground, it's the first press, it's cold press, and there are no other oils in it whatsoever. And that flavor is that flavor. Really there's three components to the pasta, generically speaking, and they are the flour and the egg and the process and what flowers we use are durum and semolina. Durum and semolina are higher in protein than all-purpose flour or baker's flour or all those other type of flours. The protein is really the skeletal structure of the pasta. It's what makes the gluten, it's what makes the, the elasticity, the tensile strength. The other item that is the core of the raw material in the pasta is, is, is whole egg. The egg and the protein in the flour are the body, the strength of the dough. And then we do a process that other people don't do and we laminate it. And lamination at Carlos Pasta means when you make pasta by hand, you make a well of flour, you put the eggs in it, you whisk it, you heel toe, heel toe knead it. That lifting and pushing is where the protein and the gluten strands end up cross hatching and that's what gives you strength in the dough. We do that on the lines. It costs us a lot per line. It slows everything down. However, when it comes off the sheeter, we have a quarter inch thick dough that has between 140 and 160 micro layers that then get sheeted thinner to go on a ravioli, a tortellini, whatever it is. But that thinness that we're able to get because of the protein, because of the um, egg, and because of that machining allows you a mouthfeel that are, you can't get it another way. Their pasta, just everything is superb. I mean, it's just, it's a good product. There's no, there's no fillers. It's, it's excellent. Our customers love it. When we ask for something, they take care of it and everybody's happy. We do get samples coming in from other companies uh, through different vendors, but we just find that Carla has always had the greatest product that works for us on our menu. Carla, I have visited factories because of being in the food world. 
everywhere in the world, in many countries, in Italy, everywhere. I have never seen anything like this, what you have here. First, it looks like an engineering genius has been let loose in there, and I'm told that's your son, Sergio. Sergio's pretty heavily into innovation. Sergio really likes to see what's the new trend. Uh, matter of fact, uh, me and him have been to Italy twice together to see what the newest and greatest machines are. And his, you know, he, he and I both have a passion for equipment. Uh, there's no doubt. Uh, Sandro thinks we buy too many pieces of equipment, but um, to be ahead and to stay ahead and to be truly authentic, you have to. Uh, and we are truly authentic. All the equipment that comes out of Italy is made out of bronzo aluminio, which is this stuff that the first time you wash it with anything that has any sort of astic or caustic or anything in it melts, starts pitting, looks like old silverware. And because we wanted everything to be clean, we had to find another way to do it. And so mom and I, we would go and we went to Italy, we went to talk to some manufacturers, what can we do to change it? And this guy goes, make it out of plastic, make it out of stainless, make it out of everything but that aluminum stuff. So immediately we started making machines, but those machines were really custom to us. We were the only ones buying them. My mother really enjoys fine things. She really appreciates really good equipment because it replicates what you do by hand. And my father many, many times has commented, I wish he liked jewelry, it'd have been a lot cheaper. We're all natural, we're moving towards organic, we're moving towards gluten-free. Uh, so we're doing all the things that uh, a good food company should be doing. Our, our food policies and our QA are second to none. We're BRC rated four years in a row, double A, which is the highest rating you can get by any kind of food standard. So we do all the nice things that uh, make the product very, very clean and good for consumers. How many employees are here today? There are 230 employees. They are not all here because we have salesmen all over the United States. And then we have a 35 to 40 employee of a company that does the cleaning at night. They specialize in cleaning. And that is the most wonderful thing we have ever found because it was very difficult to keep the third shift staffed. Is it true or is this a story? that you know the names of all the employees. Yes, yes. I know their, their story with their family, most of them. I've been at a lot of weddings of people that met, met here, uh, and uh, uh, we contribute. If they buy a new house, we give them a check uh, for a certain amount. If they get to be 30 years, 25 and 20, we give them a check so that they have to spend at the traveling agency because we want them to go, go on vacation. So they are paid for the week and they have so much money to spend to go someplace. Carla is an extraordinary person outside of work or inside of work. She takes care of her employees like their family. We all are a family here. When uh, anybody gets married, Carla gives them a wedding present. When they have a baby, she gives them a present for the babies. Also, she helps people. They buy a house, she gives them a housewarming present. She's totally committed to her employees. If we say we want to further our education, learn English, or study more to advance our career, she'll help us with financial needs. Uh, when I got here two and a half years ago, I was shocked uh, at a couple of things that I saw. Um, I saw a line at Carla's office one day where she was handing out bonuses for uh, somebody who just had a baby, somebody else who just graduated from college. And you just don't see that in today's world anymore. One of the reasons I truly love working here is that when you are employed here, you really are part of the family. Uh, family is important to Carla and her sons as well. My earliest memory with the company, uh, I want to say I was about nine years old. And I, went, I spent my summer going on sales calls all throughout New England with my grandfather. Well, I had my granddaughter during the summer. I would take her out to me to sales. Um, when selling, you never went to the front door of a, of a restaurant. You always went to the back because that's where they kept all of their boxes, where you could see who they were buying from, and you, that's where the chefs primarily went in and out. So that's how you caught their attention to be able to talk to them. So when I go in to see you, I say, this is my granddaughter. We got to buy her shoes, so I need some sales. 
And that's the way it was. He was actually using me as a ploy to sell pasta. He walked in to these chefs, and if everything that he tried did not work, his last ditch effort was, my granddaughter needs a new pair of shoes. You have to buy this pasta. Lo and behold, whenever he said that, I finally realized why I always had to wear grungy shoes, grungy clothes, and kind of just look like a little out of sorts. Then they gave me a nice surprise. They named the room after me. I said, don't give it to me when I'm dead. I want it while I'm alive. So if you go to the place, you would see it. It says Johnny D's Conference Center. So, you know, I'm very proud of that and everything. And they've been wonderful to me. And just a good, good relationship. That's what it's all about. So for you as a woman, having this global business now, uh, certainly across the United States and now global, all of the pressures, the strains, a moment when you felt like you had failed, um, being unable to, to go to certain things, what I see on the balance sheet is that it's, it's cost you something yeah. and it has given you a lot. Is that a fair statement? Yes. So what does it cost and what is it given? Oh, uh, well, a lot of things I couldn't do because I was tied, tied to this business. And uh, I regret having passed all these occasions, all of them. It would have been much, uh, much nicer to remember trips with the kids or something like that, uh, particularly. Um, but uh, what has it given me? Well, the satisfaction of doing it my way, I guess, like Sinatra says, and having brought so many people along that have helped me incredibly. You cannot do this by yourself. You have to have very, very dedicated people. You cannot keep a place that was built uh, 15 years ago, the way this place is kept. Uh, you cannot tell the one that was built three years ago from the one that was built 15 years ago. And that's is day after day after day. You cannot improvise that. If I can be honest with you, there's two Carlas. There's the Carla that's the mother that is very impassioned and cares about you and wants the best for everybody. And then there's Carla, the driven woman entrepreneur that uh, is relentless, unstopping, unyielding, and never takes her eye off the ball. Uh, that one doesn't, you don't see that one, but it's lurking behind everything. And it's the driver, uh, it, it is the engine underneath the hood of the Ferrari that you, you hear it, you don't see it, you don't understand the, all those gears that are moving but it's pushing real hard and it's making sure that every step is forward. And that, that's her magic. Carla is a wonderful person. She's down to earth. They're down to earth people, they're not fancy people. And when people come in there, if she can help them, if she hears their problems, it's like they're going to their mother. And she's really that wonderful to them. Carla's from the old school. She, she, she reminds me of my mother when my mother was alive. She just went that extra mile to take care of you. Carla, to me, yeah, she's like a mother. She is an amazing woman because she always um, take, take care about her employees. Carla is a wonderful person. Carla uh, is loyal and in business today, it's something you don't find anymore. And whenever I look at Carla's pasta and I see her face on there, it kind of gives you that presence of her uh, that is unmatched with anything else. So for us in the community to have her here is just the greatest thing and I hope she stays here forever. She really took nothing and made something and not many people can sit with the victory story like that. Carla is an extremely passionate woman um, who loves what she's doing, uh, loves her employees, 
takes great pride when she hears somebody say, boy, I had your product someplace and I really enjoyed it. The word in my language for mother is meh. That's what Carla is to me. You know, how proud am I of my mother? How many people can come to a foreign land having started by protecting her uncle from the Nazis and the fascists during the war with Zero to building what is hopefully a generational heirloom that will go on as far as I can hope perpetuity, I have no idea. What is legacy to you? Well, my granddaughters are extremely different one from the other. So the only thing that I think is gonna be a common goal is to stay very independent and to be very true to themselves. It would be nice if they continue with the business, but I don't think it's in their card. Maybe it is, I cannot exclude or include that. It's gonna be their decision, but mainly to be very honest with themselves all the time and uh, remember their grandmother like I remember my grandmother. She was, she was a, the sweetest person on earth and the most giving person on earth. So that would be a big success for me if they remember me like that. They mean a lot to me. They are the best part of being old and uh, being so free as they are because I see them very free, possibly the first generation of women that does not have all the baggage that I had. They are free and they are enthusiastic and they are, and they are just perfect. <laughs> How can I say any different? They are perfect and I hope they follow whatever their um, desire is and do a good job in whatever they try to do. There are generations that we won't even know and I wonder if this is a chance to say something to them. What, what comes to mind? Still tr be true to yourself and don't try to be somebody you're not. Because that would be betraying the, the basic thing of your nature. So that's, I think that's what I would say. It would be interesting to come back and see though. It would be. In this Italian? I like that. Thank you.